The Secret of Monkey Island is a point-and-click adventure classic. Released in 1990, it's well known for its wit, atmosphere, and unforgettable characters. But to some, it's more than just one of the best adventure games ever made. It's also a speedrun. Monkey Island is a game of inches. It is really like trying to scrape for every little bit of frame saved you can find. It's like playing a phrase of music. There's a bit of a feeling and an ebb and flow to it where if you kind of get, get that phrase just right, there's nothing more satisfying than, than that. It's easy to understand why some would be dismissive of point-and-click speedruns. Pick things up, talk to people, choose a verb, click, click, click again. But today, you'll learn why The Secret of Monkey Island takes an incredible amount of skill to speedrun at a top level, and why runners keep coming back to it year after year. We won't be looking at the special edition of Monkey Island from 2009. It has its own mechanics and strategies and leaderboard. Instead, we'll look at runs of the original versions. Runners are allowed to use any of these, though most prefer the 1992 CD release. One reason is that the inventory items have a bigger hitbox, which are easier to select than the small text of the early versions. The earliest recorded run I could find is of Phallos Vogel running the game on November 5th, 2005. Given the year, it shouldn't be surprising that the run was recorded in 240p, so I'm going to hold off on describing the run for just a moment. Phallos Vogel's time was 46.12, a time which wouldn't be beaten until two years later. This run was completed by someone called either Mike or Chaos, depending on the source, with a time of 39.12. This was also recorded in 240p. These were solid beginnings, but to save our eyeballs, we're going to skip ahead to the next run. This is Cryptones, running the game on April 11th, 2013. Thank you, Cryptones, for your crispy pixels. Now, I'm not going to explain every action because this isn't a walkthrough. Instead, I'll describe the run in outline and mention the important details. The game begins on Melee Island. We play as Guybrush Threepwood. My name's Guybrush Threepwood, and I want to be a pirate. Yikes! To become a pirate, Guybrush has to complete three trials, tests of swordplay, thievery, and treasure huntery. You can complete these trials in the order you want. Cryptones begins with the Trial of the Sword, which means defeating Carla, the Swordmaster. To learn Carla's hidden location, we convince the shopkeeper to visit Carla and then secretly follow him. Or maybe not so secretly. Carla won't fight us until we're more experienced, so after getting some training, it's time for what might be the most iconic part of the game, insult sword fighting. Sword fights in Monkey Island are won not by quick reflexes, but by wit. And in order to defeat Carla, we need to learn some insults. You have to hear the insult used on you. I've spoken with apes more polite than you. And then you have to use the insult back, and then that pirate has to know the answer for you to learn the response to the insult. I've spoken with apes more polite than you. I'm glad to hear you attended your family reunion. And then you still need to learn more insults, learn more responses. So there's so many steps and each step is affected by the roll of the dice. Every time you insult a pirate, he may or may not know the correct response. And every time a pirate insults Guybrush, the insult you get is random. You can pull your hair out a little bit because it is RNG. You want to get certain uh, answers and certain insults at the right time. And you're kind of building your, uh, your CV of, of insults to go against Carla at the end. So if they're not giving you good ones, it can be frustrating. You need to defeat at least three pirates before the game lets you take on Carla. Going to her as soon as possible obviously saves time, but the fewer insults you know, the less likely you are to win. So there's a balance to be struck here. How many pirates, how many insults, how much risk do you want to take? In this run, Cryptones fights eight pirates and learns nine insults. The whole process takes a little over three minutes. Then it's off to Carla. But there's a twist. When you go to Carla, she doesn't use the same insults that every other pirate uses. Players need to do some lateral thinking to figure out which of the old responses will work with the new insults. Carla's insults are picked randomly as well, and if you don't know enough responses, you'll fail and have to try again. Cryptones defeats Carla and gets this amazing t-shirt. It says, I beat the Swordmaster. 
Next, Cryptones takes on the trial of a treasure huntery. Normally, you're supposed to buy a map from this entirely trustworthy looking gentleman. The map guides you through the forest to the spot of the treasure, but Cryptones has played the game before and navigates without needing an aid. With the first two trials complete, we only have to steal an idol. Since cutscenes can be skipped by pressing escape, we barely have time to meet Governor Elaine Marley before learning that the ghost pirate LeChuck has kidnapped her and taken her to Monkey Island. Guybrush needs to assemble a crew and go after her. We also need a means of transport. Cryptones visits Stan, the used boat salesman, and learns that Guybrush's meager amount of coin is not enough to buy even the most modest of vessels. Helpfully, Stan tells us that if we were to obtain a note of credit from the shopkeeper, he would gladly take that as payment. Back in town, we watch the shopkeeper get the note of credit from his safe, which is how we learn the combination. Guybrush doesn't qualify for any credit, but we convince the shopkeeper to go visit the Swordmaster again. This gives Cryptones the opportunity to open the safe and borrow the credit. We now go back to Stan, buy the ship, and set off with our crew. Except a rescue operation is the last thing on the crew's mind, and it's pretty much all up to Guybrush. Our task in this part is to follow a magic recipe, which, once completed, will guide the ship to Monkey Island. So, Cryptones gathers a lot of items and throws them into the pot. Once that's done, Guybrush cannons himself to shore. Our ultimate task on Monkey Island is to find LeChuck's underground hideout. After running around the whole island solving puzzles, we can finally get inside the second biggest monkey head we've ever seen. Guybrush is now in the Catacombs, a labyrinth of macabre rooms that stands between us and LeChuck's ghost ship. The layout changes randomly as you walk through it, and there's really no way to find your way through on your own. We require the head of the navigator. This delightful severed head turns around and points where you need to go. I think it wants me to go to the front. Once you've gone through six room transitions, you're done and you've reached the ship. If you exit a room in a direction the head wasn't pointing, the counter goes down instead of being unchanged, so you would need to go through an extra correct transition to compensate. If you get enough bad transitions, you'll be sent back to the beginning. There are some pitfalls though. There are good rooms and bad rooms, and a bad room is a room that is uh, large, so you need to go across the whole room, or um, the room is actually two rooms wide, so you actually have to wait for the room to slide over and then you continue going, and that doesn't count as an exit. You often either get like a really long room, or you need to transition it, which are both very slow, or you get a really fast room. Like it's either really fast or really slow. There's not a lot of in between for catacombs, and you need to, you know, get it six times. It's not just the one RNG, it rolls RNG multiple times. There's also a bit of an annoyance with the navigator head. The navigator head doesn't always work. That's the problem with it. There are times where the navigator head says, go to the right, but it's only because you just load it into, in, into the room. You actually have to move a little bit to get the actual read on the head. And sometimes walking on a vertical path will mess with the head's orientation. So you're not likely to be exactly on the middle pixel. You're either some pixels to the left or some pixels to the right. And what happens is that the game basically is like, hey, you still have some horizontal movement to do before getting to the middle pixel where you can then move vertically. So the head turns either right or left and it gets confusing it's annoying i mean if you watch somebody play casually through that section it's you know i don't know how many people rack up the the, the money in their swear jars in this run cryptones gets three long rooms and five short rooms with a total of eight that means one of the exits was incorrect and cryptones needed an extra exit to make up for it with that part done, we need to sneak onto LeChuck's ship, which means that we need to gently persuade the head of the navigator to part with his necklace. Putting on the necklace makes Guybrush invisible. From here, we grab a voodoo root and hightail it back to some cannibals who use it to make a ghost-destroying voodoo root beer. Alas, LeChuck was too quick for us. Maybe he's a speedrunner too, and he's taken Elaine Marley back to Melee Island to marry her. Guybrush is quick to follow, and in a madcap sequence, Guybrush interrupts the wedding and defeats the ghost pirate LeChuck. Time ends when the game fades to black after the final cutscene, and Cryptones has earned a 3650. So, aside from some potentially frustrating RNG, what's so hard about running an adventure game like Monkey Island? So, uh, this guy once came to my stream and he was like, hey, this is not a real speed game. Uh, what I told him was, uh, take the first Mario game. 
like Super Mario Bros. Usually when you play it casually, you just hold right and jump and that's basically everything you do. And even in the speedrun, most of the time this is what you do. You hold right and jump, but uh, you need to optimize some small details. You need to be able to optimize everything and every game is like that. You don't get frame perfect things for free. So that's, I think, where a lot of the skill comes from. There's very little in the way of audio cues for anything, very little visual information to go off of, too. So you really don't get a lot of help in really trying to, you know, shave off these little bits of frames. I think that's where the main, like, execution really lies for the run. The thing is, criticizing these speedruns is very easy when you're just looking at the surface level. Playing these games fast requires memorization for several dialogue choices, good mouse control, hand placement for fast keyboard shortcuts, timing button presses for interfacing with objects, and patience for coping with RNG. You can enter into an almost zen-like state where everything is coming together perfectly. It's a great feeling. That's A Way of Life speaking there, also known as Steve. In 2017, A Way of Life would start to leave his mark on the game. At the time I held the record in Monkey Island 2, I had a comfortable lead over Frozen Spade who had just started running the game, and I felt like I needed a challenge. One thing that actually put me off running Monkey 1 for a while though was the sword fighting minigame. I knew any good time made was going to be determined by RNG. I hated that. I was not looking forward to resetting runs because of it. But at the end of the day, sword fighting is part of the game, and it's unavoidable, so I had to do it. A Way of Life would learn the run and begin unlocking the game's secrets. On August 9th, 2017, he was streaming attempts and got to the part where he needs the credit from the shopkeeper's safe. Normally you talk to the shopkeeper about getting credit so you can buy a boat from Stan. He walks away from his desk, up the stairs, and over to the safe. At which point, the idea is to watch the combination to the safe so you can break into it yourself. He does this again after the next dialogue to put the credit slip back into the safe. Of course, during the speedrun, we're able to press escape and skip this sequence, but you have to watch him do it at least once or you won't know the combination. But on this run, something different happened. Whoa. Three. 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 One. Three, 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 one. Did you see that? There was a glitch. He walked through the shop up an invisible staircase. When you skip the first cutscene as soon as possible, the glitch makes the shopkeeper walk to the safe in a more direct path, which saves several seconds. A Way of Life would continue making steady progress, but even with his best efforts, he was minutes off world record. After comparing video footage, Guybrush moved faster in Krypton's run compared to normal. I was not sure why this was. Was it a glitch? Was there video on YouTube running faster? Were they cheating? I didn't have any proof of anything, so I didn't want to make accusations. Besides, Krypton's run was over four years old at this point, and were not active on speedrun.com, so I didn't feel I could ask them about it directly. And then, Steve would get a run that felt faster. Sure enough, when he lined it up with the world record, it matched. Both he and Krypton's left the Lucasfilm logo running before hitting the escape key, which is when the timing for the run starts. It turns out that if you skip the opening cutscene when the logo starts sparkling, Guybrush just moves faster for the rest of the game. The difference in speed isn't immediately obvious, but it's enough to save minutes over the course of the run. No one knows for sure why this works, but it might have something to do with the frame rate of the sparkles. Speed Glitch wasn't the only innovation that A Way of Life discovered. He was also improving the route. The game won't let you through all of the forest screens until one of two things happens. Either you follow the shopkeeper or you buy the map, which is what A Way of Life does instead. This allows for more freedom in routing the early game. In this run, he faces nine pirates during the sword fighting and has a bit of trouble finding a few on the trail. They wander on the melee island paths. A way of life's catacombs are, in his words, awful with many slow runes. Nevertheless, Guybrush's faster movement meant a way of life had dropped the record to 3602. My first secret of Monkey Island world record, the 3602, finally beating Kryptons after discovering the speed glitch. That was a great time, and it was very exciting knowing I could take it further. 
With more practice, he would follow this up with a 34-29 and then a 33-53 on September 3rd. He would then take a break from speedrunning Secret of Monkey Island, instead focusing on other games like Monkey Island 2, Day of the Tentacle, and Fate of Atlantis, and on normal people things like employment. A Way of Life would finally come back to Secret of Monkey Island in January of 2019 because of a development with ScumVM. To run games like The Secret of Monkey Island on modern computers, players use ScumVM, a re-implementation of the original Scum engine. Infamous speedrunner Urquan, who I've mentioned a few times on this channel before, had developed a new version of ScumVM with speedrunners in mind. This version essentially brought the engine closer to a native DOS environment, which also fixed an issue some runners were having with Scum-based games. ScumVM was found to be a little bit unreliable because the de depending on the machine that you were using, you could save or lose some time. When I was running Monkey Island 2, my best estimates was that I was losing two to three minutes. Urquan's version of ScumVM solved this problem and got everyone onto a level playing field. It also had the side effect of slightly increasing the game speed. The changes that Urquan brought to ScumVM had an instant impact in terms of speedrunning. Monkey Island 1 and 2 saw the most benefit with an obvious speed boost to the gameplay, which allowed runners to shave more time off. Like the speed glitch, this new version of the engine wouldn't be noticeably faster to casual players, 0.3 frames per second of gameplay. But over the course of 30 minutes, this makes a huge difference. A Way of Life also made a discovery in the sword fight with Carla. Some insult responses can work against more than one of Carla's insults. These came to be known as multi-responses, or multi-resps for short. This allowed for more potential time save in the sword fighting, but also complicated the mental calculations. So, for instance, if you learn a family reunion, but you also have learned uh, smell your breath, they both are multi-resps, so that's pretty good, but they do overlap, so that's not as good as it could have been. There's also an insult that you can learn from the bridge troll, but getting it takes two extra seconds, and it also overlaps with family reunion. That is like a big brain thing that you can really sink a lot of your, your thought processes into how you're going to, you know, which path you're going to take, how do I improvise in these certain situations. So the difficulty is quite deep when you get into it. Do you see how good Family Reunion is there? When it used it three times, that's how awesome that insult is. With Urquan's Scum VM, Fast Catacombs, and a little determination, A Way of Life took the record down to 3310. Six. Oh, that was really good. It was also at this time that runner Leolitz would join the community. He would begin finding optimizations, like this one at the safe, when you watch the shopkeeper input the combination. So the way the safe works is that you need to input four correct numbers. Each of them is between one and four. But because uh, the way to open the safe is to push and pull the correct number of times, once you input the first three numbers, the fourth number, you don't really need to know it. You can just continue to pull until the safe automatically opens. A tiny optimization, then, would be to skip the animation of the shopkeeper opening the safe once you've seen the first three numbers, because you don't really need to see the fourth one. There is, however, a risk involved. If you go too fast on the fourth digit, the safe can sometimes glitch. It's almost like a Schrodinger safe, both open and closed at the same time, and you can't get the contents inside. Leolitz would continue discussing the game and sharing insights on the Speedy Adventures Discord, a server that had been created by Frozen Spade in 2018. Speedy Adventures was, and is, a Discord server for point-and-click adventure speedrunning. I'm pretty proud of uh, the little community we've built. If anybody wants to learn any Monkey Island speed game, Come by the Speedy Adventures Discord. We can get you hooked up. When I first started streaming my Monkey 2 runs on Twitch, I was afraid I would be laughed at. I was instead approached by people who found it fascinating, new, and a fun idea that they hadn't considered before. I'm very proud that we founded this community and long may it continue. Speedy Adventures would occasionally hold marathons. On January 25th, 2019, A Way of Life was running The Secret of Monkey Island at one of these marathons, with Frozen Spade commentating. In the days leading up to the marathon, A Way of Life had already dropped the record to 32-22. 
I felt nervous during the whole thing, handling both being on mic talking about the run along with Frozen Spade, and also trying to concentrate. I made a few mistakes here and there, but I got a good Swordmaster time and three quick exits in the catacombs. It's a great run that I'm still proud of to this day. The record was now 3102. This run, and the one leading up to the marathon, were also the first world records to have another one of those small time saves. Beach warping. In Monkey Island, um, the island in the game, not the game itself, I know, it gets confusing. Uh, there are various beaches in which you can walk. And usually, when you click on them, you just run there. And as soon as Guybrush reaches them, uh, the scene gets loaded. But there is one in particular, the southern one, where if you click it, in the border between the beach and the sea, you instantly warp there. You don't run there, you instantly warp there and you're suddenly there. As a great illustration of the teamwork between the runners, no one seems to remember who found this glitch. I'm pretty sure it was Steve who uh, was able to do it the first time on accident. I think Spade found it like a couple of days after I joined or something. What we do know, however, is that the world record would not stand for long. Leolitz had been putting in work, practicing, analyzing, and looking for optimizations. On March 31st, Leo would share a new route. Well, sort of new. At the time, what we used to do was to first do the Swordmaster task, then the treasure hunt task, and then steal the idol. I was looking at some runs in the leaderboard, and the last one was by Meal toast or Amiga runs, it goes by both names. And the reason why it was so slow is because it was in Amiga. Milk Toast stole the idol before completing the other trials. If you steal the idol, right after it, you get teleported basically in front of the scan bar. And if you do this task first, this saves a lot in backtracking. Being warped to the dock, where players are thrown into the sea by Fester Shinetop, puts runners closer to the forest and saves a trip out of town later. It's always exciting when there's a route change. There is a lot of theorizing and calculating how much it will save. And you think to yourself, why didn't I think of this first? Leolitz would further analyze the dialogue when haggling with Stan for the ship. So there is a hidden value in the game, which is how much Stan is willing to accept in order to sell you the boat. I'd like to pay 2,000 pieces of eight. Sure, I guess we can start out at the bottom. The way you change it is by bartering with him, basically. So I did time every possible interaction and I wrote a program that basically given every uh, interaction how much it takes and how much uh, it lowers the hidden value, it calculates the best possible way to do the dialogue. And I did find a new way, so that was nice. With the new route, Leolitz would finally beat a way of life's record by nearly 30 seconds. What the hell? What the hell is this? But Leo was not the only runner making progress. There's different types of speedrunners. There's routing, there's glitch hunting, different things. I consider myself an optimizer. Frozen Spade would begin his speedrunning journey with Monkey Island 2. It's the first game I ever remember even seeing. I remember watching my dad play through the game and I, uh, they tell me, I'm too young to remember, they tell me I would bug him all the time to watch him play the pirate game. Sometime after Steve tried out Secret Monkey Island, I, I, I watched him and I said, hey, that looks fun. Spade would soon turn his attention to the somewhat overlooked Chapter 2. Putting together all the ingredients is the main objective in Chapter 2, so you can get your ship to Monkey Island. Mm, this is going to be good. I was focused on minimizing the amount of mouse movement. So what I figured out you can do is you can use pot with item, then use item with pot. So I'm kind of going back and forth instead of going, you know, item to pot, item to pot. The game kind of lets you go back and forth. It was saving somewhere in the realm of five to ten seconds just by optimizing this one thing. In April, a few weeks after Leo's world record, Spade would be streaming on his birthday. On defeating Carla, Spade is 20 seconds ahead of his personal best. Some solid execution, including the adjusted soup route, helps him up until the end game. Aside from a bit of a stumble in the beginning, Frozen Spade's catacombs go extremely quickly. This is good. Yes, yes. I will take it. Uh, talk to the head. What am I doing? Freaking out. This could be it. And we got the skip. 
Wait, what skill? At some point you need to use the necklace because it gives you invisibility. When you use the necklace for the first time, there is a small animation of Guybrush having a blue outline around him to indicate that it's working. This feels weird. We found that if for some reason you walk down the slope and use the necklace at a certain point, the animation will skip, which saves a couple of seconds. In the end, Frozen Spade's hard work and practice had paid off. Woo! 30.08. There it is. Oh, practice. Yes, the key to victory. Not to be left out, A Way of Life was also making attempts using the new Milk Toast route. In this run, he defeats Carla at 10.09, a minute faster than Spade's world record. Spade's post-sword fight and Chapter 2 were really strong, however, and by the time A Way of Life gets to Monkey Island, his lead has shrunk to only 30 seconds. The catacombs are about even with frozen spades, and he's able to bring it home with a 29.38. First person to get sub-30. There you go. Done. The competition would continue with a run by Leo Litz on May 3rd, 2019. Up until the catacombs, Leo was ahead of a way of life's record, but only by two seconds. The run was now up to luck. Okay, please, catacombs. Right. Yeah, obviously right. Whoa! Leolitz's catacombs were so fast, he gained an extra 15 seconds. He would maintain that lead and finish with a 29-16. Oh my god. What record. As we've seen, world records would go to those skilled enough to master the game's movement and patient enough to grind for the right RNG. But what if there was a way to avoid all that? To, as one runner would put it, bend the RNG to their whim. What happened next would prove controversial and change the course of the speedrun. Runners had been saving the game sparingly throughout the run, such as right before the Carla sword fight. That way, if they lost, they could quickly start over without having to leave and come back. But Spade would extend that idea to all of the RNG. In Monkey Island 2, we had started implementing save load strats at the end of the game for the LeChuck sequence. But in Monkey Island 1, we had wondered if save loading could be used for sword fighting. So I did a bunch of practice off stream. And fortunately for us, the RNG was always determined at like the last possible moment. Frozen Spade then practiced saving just before the pirate either gives an insult or provides a response. He would then reload if he didn't get the result he wanted. And I can learn the insults I want, then I can roll to make sure that they will give me the answer, and then I can roll to make sure they won't know the answer so I can win the fight. Because you need to win three fights before the Swordmaster will fight you. So puts these those three elements much more into the player's control. Frozen Spade would extend this strategy to the fight with Carla and to the catacombs. You just save right before an exit, go through. If you got a fast room, you take it, save again. If you got a slow room, you just reset and try again. Still, like the better RNG you had, the faster it would go. Spade would earn a 28.17, a full minute faster than world record. But there was a bit of a mixed response. One issue was that quick saving and quick loading were scum VM features and were not available in the original versions of the game. We are more or less forced to play on an emulator if we want to play these games. There are things that are possible in the emulator that weren't necessarily possible in an old computer back in the day. Another reason was that RNG was seen by some as an essential part of the game. Because of this, A Way of Life decided to make saves and saveless two separate leaderboard categories. My original reason for making saves separate from saveless is because of a precedent established in Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. That game has a lot, and I mean a lot, of RNG segments in the run. Two runners of the game, Chuck Grody and the infamous Urquan, decided that they wanted to implement save strats into the run. I was of the opinion that we should split the leaderboard, that RNG, as frustrating as it is, is a part of the game. 
As Captain Picard said in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness, that is life. RNG is life, it is chaos. It is things that you cannot control. It is accepting that things won't always go your way. And that is okay, as long as we keep trying. My argument was to not split the categories. In my mind, the route didn't really change at all between the two. The save load was an advanced strategy that top runners could learn and implement, but there was the argument that it was not native to the original game, which I thought was fair, but I didn't think it was worth splitting up such a small community already. So I got outvoted, uh, and I think it was Steve who made the ultimate decision to split the categories. I think this is probably not a shock to anybody. But at the time, I was kind of upset about it because, um, and I don't think this was intentional, by splitting the categories, it put my world record onto another page and it put Steve's old time before the save load stuff into the first place on the, the front page, which I, I believe was not his intention, but that happening kind of did make me upset about it. With the category split, Frozen Spade would stop running the secret of Monkey Island, at least for the time being. Leolitz would continue his own journey in the saves category. He would even create simulations to test various strategies, like the merits of fighting only three pirates versus four. He would eventually settle on fighting three pirates, and aside from the two responses the game gives you automatically, he would learn only one multi-response. While this has the potential to be faster, it is, on average, slower than the safer strats with more responses. Leo would then beat Spade's world record by one second. 28-16. I think this is a world record. By such a small margin, but I think it is. On May 23rd, 2019, he would get a run nearly on pace. One of the downsides of the three pirate strat is that he has to cycle the RNG on the last Carla insult many times. Leo actually ends up losing two seconds over world record, but he was able to make up the time in chapter two. Gold, didn't expect that to be honest. Maybe, just maybe. Yes! Oh, yes, it is! It is a gold! <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Leo would then take a long break from speedrunning Monkey Island 1, having pushed the saves category as far as he thought he could. World record activity would be quiet, though many new runners joined and put runs on the board. But eventually, Leo would return and start using a strategy that was extremely simple in concept, but devilishly frustrating. The solution to the combination for the safe is randomized every time, but it is not logic locked. Usually, if Guybrush doesn't know something, you cannot do it, even if you know it. Uh, the game kinda blocks you. This is not one of those cases. So, what you can do is guess. You can guess the combination to the safe. Hmm. So there's 256 combinations. You test 16 combinations as fast as you possibly can. Anytime you go over those 16 combinations, you're typically going to start losing time. That is a, a high risk, high reward. I mean, you put you put the run on the line to do that strat, but if it lands, you know, it, like it's a lottery ticket. Runners only had a 6.25% chance of getting credit early, but getting the combination quickly could potentially save a lot of time. In order to trigger the dialogue option that allows us to know the combination of the safe, we first need to go to stand, realize that we don't have enough money, go to the shop, get the credit, and go to stand again. Now we can skip the first time we go to stand. But there's another confounding factor. To open the safe, the shopkeeper needs to be out of the shop. If you get lucky, he won't be in the shop at all, which happens 25% of the time. The other 75%, you have to convince him to leave, which loses about nine seconds. At this point, you might be wondering if there's an easier way to open the safe. Milk Toast, the Amiga runner I mentioned earlier, emailed Ron Gilbert himself to ask how the safe worked. Ron kindly wrote back and confirmed, it's just random. 
Now, it's not like no one had thought of this strategy before. Leo had been thinking about credit early since he first joined the community, but no one had wanted to grind for the necessary luck. But on April 25th, 2020, Leo would take a chance. But, oh, I, I can try a new strategy here. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Let's go. It's also a goal. Okay, okay, okay. I don't have to worry about this category anymore. 2020 would also see the return of Frozen Spade. 2020 was the 30 year anniversary, so I said, okay, let me come back. And I, I did do some saveless runs. My goal was to, using the credit early strat, to get a saveless world record. One, two, oh, hello. It came relatively soon. The luck was indeed in my favor. And then it, it all came together. It was only barely faster than Leo's time. Frozen Spade now had the saveless world record. But just a few days later, something monumental would shake up the leaderboard again. On October 3rd, 2020, A Way of Life reversed the controversial decision to divide the categories into saves and saveless. The difference in strategies would now be indicated by a variable on the leaderboards. Frozen Spade was not happy about the split, feeling it was unnecessary. He turned out to be right in the end as only a few runners were submitting runs to the saves category. I changed the board back, and I have no plans to split it again. With the categories reunited, Frozen Spade would start grinding saves runs again. At this point, the only way to have a shot at getting a new world record would be to get credit early. If you are at the point where you want to push for a top time, I think you'd need credit early at this point. Very few runs actually get to get started. And no dice. All right. And I've watched hours of runs from other people doing it, and they've gone straight whole streams without hitting one, or if they get one, they get that RNG down the line or something like that. Yeah, it just doesn't work a lot. So it's really a big grind. Frozen Spade would practice another way to make this section faster, originally suggested by Leo. He would use multiple quick save slots to go back and forth between multiple combinations more quickly. This takes a lot of practice and keeping track of the different slots in your head. And it's also a pretty uh, crazy strategy of trying to save load, do a bunch of a bunch of combinations quick, saving back to what, one of the old saves kind of going through and trying to do a combination as fast as possible. During his grind, Spade realized that to get another PB, he would need to get credit early in under 16 seconds. If the shopkeeper was out, that meant he had time for 28 different combinations with about an 11% chance of success. If the shopkeeper was in, he would lose 9 seconds, leaving only time for 16 combinations, or 6.25%. And, by the way, this is three minutes into the run. It is amazing watching Frozen Spade and Leo Litz do these credit early runs. The anticipation of, will this be the one? Will the RNG bless us? It's such a fun time being in the chat for these streams. It elevates the run even more when it happens, and it is exciting to watch the runner then have to bring the run home for another possible world record. You get credit early, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is it, we gotta run. Like, And, and suddenly like the vibe just changes on the rest of the run. It's, it's super fun to do. Uh, two, <gasps> well, I don't know about how much. Oh my goodness. Frozen Spade had brought his time down, but was still 15 seconds shy of Leo's world record. In addition to credit early, the run also featured two more small time saves. Spade, ever the optimizer, had developed a new variation of his soup route. At one point during the soup sequence, you have to use the fire under the pot to get a little fire you carry around in your pocket. So I realized at some point by putting the map, which is at the top of your inventory, into the fire, because that gives you a new item, it automatically scrolls your inventory down to the bottom. So it saves me a little bit of time on scrolling. Additionally, a discovery was made that saved some time during the treasure hunt. Somebody found a video of somebody doing this warp in the forest on a certain screen with the map. The map, I guess, it was encoded too well. 
it messes up with the camera and also in one specific room and only one if you look at it as soon as you exit the screen where the map is displayed Guybrush got teleported to the other side of a chasm and we really don't know why we discovered that we could actually use that to save just a little bit of time it's like a second or less so you can add those to the mountain of techniques runners developed over the years. In fact, I've held back a little on discussing some of them because there are just so many. But I also don't want to give the impression that hitting the credit early jackpot is the only thing that matters in the run. So here are my top five things about Monkey Island speedrunning that aren't major time saves but are kind of cool if you've played the game before. These include a few puzzle spoilers, so if you want to avoid that, I don't know why you're watching an explanation of the speedrun, we've been spoiling things since like the first minute of the video. Number one, based on playthroughs I've watched, the casual player may not know that every verb has a keyboard shortcut. Also, right-clicking on doors will open and close them, and dialogues can be selected with the number keys. Number two, normally you have to step on this plank three times to grab a red herring. Speedrunners are so fast, they only step on it twice. Number three, in a similar vein, there's a puzzle where you transfer grog from one melting cup to another. The game lets you take a lot of them, but if you're quick, you only need two. Number four, if you time it right, it's possible to enter doors before they open. Number five, the first time you come to this screen, the game takes control and walks Guybrush to the center. But you have maybe three or four frames right when the screen transition happens to talk to the navigator head. If you pull it off, this skips an animation of putting the head away and pulling it out again. It saves about two and a half seconds, it's really hard to do, and no one's pulled it off in a world record. And now, back to your regularly scheduled speedrun history. In January of 2021, a runner named Mike the Viewer would bring something up in Discord that would result in yet another small time save. There's a lot of these like longer screens in the Monkey Island games where as you walk from one side to the other, the screen will inch over slowly. But pressing Control R would turn on Snap Scroll, which disables the scrolling. The reason why we didn't do it before was because we knew that ScamVM allowed you to do it, but ScamVM allows you to do a lot of things, and it wasn't really clear that uh, the game itself was coded that way. Now I actually did end up digging up an old manual that I found had a reference to turning on Snap Scroll. So then it uh, became legal at that point. There's not a, a ton of spots where it applies, but you know, in the few spots it does, over the run, it saves us a few seconds. For example, it was now worthwhile to use a shortcut in the town of Melee Island. There's a screen in Melee Island where you have the doors that kind of go back and forth. And for the most part, it was actually a, a trap. You would think it would be a shortcut, but what happens is once you enter that door, the screen takes a long time to scroll over to the other door, and it would be a bit slower than just walking around the long way. But now with Snap Scroll, we can take the door shortcut and it is now a little bit faster. Frozen Spade would continue running the game into the summer of 2021. By now, Spade had perfected a different sword fight strategy than Leo. He begins by getting the insult from the bridge troll. Spade then fights four pirates instead of three. The extra pirate loses time initially, but knowing the extra responses makes the Carla fight faster on average. Oh, another good one. One more. Holy guacamole pants. Oh, my freaking crust, dude. Calm down. Everybody calm down. All right, everybody shut up. Oh, I didn't get the right option there. 27. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, I forgot to get this ready. Oh, my goodness. Oh, they're throwing money in the air. Wait. Wait, come back. Oh, whoops, some of the money ended up in the trash can. Don't go there. Yes. Choose prediction outcome. Nobody, I can't believe it. Nobody voted yes. No believers in the chat. Come on. He had done it. World record by one second.
And, as Spade was now the world record holder, he was the first one on the list when Games Done Quick came calling. The show I was on is called Time Capsule, where you're showing off games from a certain year. In this case, the year was 1990, the year The Secret of Monkey Island came out. And they approached me, asked me if I was available. I said, heck yes. The event was held on August 31st, with the Wolfs commentating. Yeah, I was stoked to be on a GDQ event. It was really nice of Spade to ask me to do commentary on that. So yeah, I was thrilled. I was like, this is amazing that this is happening. That's super cool. Welcome back to Time Capsule, everybody. Thank you for sticking with us for the final run this evening, The Secret of Monkey Island. When we were talking beforehand, he was saying he wasn't going to go for credit early. It's not like not really worth it. Let's just go through and have a normal run or whatever so that we can talk through it. I get on the day. I'm very nervous, of course. And go. Maybe 15 minutes out from when we're going live. And he sends me a message that says, I'm going to do it. So I figured, you know, we're just going to show it off. See if credit early happens. Got our first bit of shopping here to do. And then we're going to show off. We're going to we're going to make an attempt at a pretty RNG strat. Wiss, do you want to cover that? We were joking in our pre-test before we went on. If we get the good at marathon luck, we, you know, that would be crazy. We're going to try to just brute force this thing and open it without knowing the, uh, the, you know, the combination at all. There's four general moves that we're doing. Um, so a push and a pull and a push oh my and a pull. Gosh. Um, so Spade is... I oh, can't wow, believe it. Hit. I was like, okay, Spade is going to explain it. He's going to try it. It's probably not going to work. And then it worked. It was absolutely incredible. If you go see the photo I wrote in caps lock, something like I cannot believe you spade or something like that. And I was really hoping not to get banned from GDQ because of caps lock, but it was absolutely insane. The entire energy changed. As soon as that ding happened, that's the moment where I'm like, okay, uh, I'm like shuffling my papers around trying to figure out what to do next. Spade had gotten the unlikely credit early, but the rest of the run, its execution, its RNG was still ahead of him. We got credit early. We got very fast sword fighting and very good catacombs all came together in one run. It's insane. This being a marathon, Spade had opted to have chat up instead of a timer. Up until the very end, he had no idea what his time was. And that's time. 27.30. Tw Did you just say 27.30? Yeah, 27.30. That's, that's new world record. Wow. What? Wow, dude. <laughs> That's, oh my gosh, that's a huge, my my PB is a 27.45. That's a world that's record by 15 awesome. seconds. Holy guacamole. That's I, crazy. I certainly did not expect that to happen today. <laughs> All the pieces, both big and small, had come together in one amazing run that remains the world record to this day. Frozen Spade's 27.30 stands out as a fantastic run. That is the first time a Monkey Island game has been featured at a GDQ event, and the run was blessed with great RNG, which was great timing, and a fantastic showcase of not only Spade's talents, but also for point-and-click adventure speed running as a whole. Me being nervous, there were some dumb mistakes. It could have been even better, but I'm, I'm still, you know, in the end, I'm very proud of it. But yeah, boy howdy, was my heart beating. Hey folks, one short I hear. This was one of the longest projects I've ever worked on, so if you've made it this far and enjoyed it, I'd appreciate a like and a subscribe if you haven't done so already. I really want to thank everyone who helped make this video, all the runners who were kind enough to answer my many questions over many months. I just, I could not have done it without them. I'd also like to thank my patrons for their support. Feel free to leave a comment about what games you'd like to see in the future, and until then, I think you'll enjoy watching my other speedrun histories. That's it for now, thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.